Hey, what's up guys? It's Nick. I wanted to do a few little announcements here. Uh, we kind of liked how the announcements were at the beginning on the last couple episodes. It kind of kept the flow of the podcast going, didn't have to break it up. So yeah, let's just stick with it for, for the time being. I think we're still running our survey on minordetailspodcast.com. And please go do that. It really helps out the podcast. And you have a chance to win a bottle opener, so that'll be cool. Um, we want to thank our promotional partner, Design Daily, and they are at Let's Design Daily on Instagram. They really do post some really intriguing design work. So if you aren't following them, go follow them. Uh, you guys know what to do. Rate five stars on iTunes, or not iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, all the podcast places, Spotify. Spotify is actually becoming a larger portion of our listening audience, so follow there. And I think that's it. Fun episode. Oh, also, I did want to say we coincidentally recorded this episode maybe two days before Tesla announced their new Cybertruck, so we were not aware of it. I just want to say that because you'll hear us talk about electric cars in this episode, and it's just funny to hear us talk about it before the announcement, and a lot of things have changed since then. Anyways, hopefully we'll get to cover the Tesla truck at some point in the future, but let's get to it. minor details i'm nick and i'm james and we are two industrial designers in the big city sweating the small stuff Whew. james i completely forgot last episode that we didn't even say our tagline no we didn't yeah we had, well first of all we had a great episode with dan last week yeah we were just so excited to get into it <laughs> um uh but yeah what have you been up to uh not a whole lot let me see what we've written down oh my posters are almost ready oh i mean they're almost they are printed okay. i've got the shipping tubes i'm just waiting for um the plastic like, like sleeve. baggies okay. sleeves to yeah. put them in so that they can be weather protected um and uh yeah so hopefully by next week i'm gonna be starting to sell those okay uh it's through exciting. edor I mean, the whole point around these posters is to do something that's significantly more affordable than my bottle openers. Right. Um, because, you know, with a 3D printed metal bottle opener, it's just a bit more pricey. Right. Than, so, yeah, just make something that's a bit more affordable. I mean, one day I think the 3D printing is going to, you know, the cost keeps coming down for those these things. So, yeah. I mean, the game's changing for sure. So I'm excited to start selling those. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. Speaking of 3D printed production products. Oh, yeah? I've been, uh, just recently started posting more about my uh, gantry light. Oh, which yeah. Which I believe I teased on one of the episodes, but really haven't talked about it much. It's been under wraps for a while. Right. Um, mainly just because I wanted to make sure that it actually got through to the very end before right. I started posting it. Because it would be really sad if I posted a lot of work and everyone got really excited and then it failed <laughs> <laughs> why would it fail well I or don't know. just like the design itself it's a it's a hard design like it's it's something it's not like a simple lamp like it's not like just a form it has this right pixelated grid on it um which i've been experimenting with mm -hmm. so i don't know it's interesting um i also just uh i was listening to the collective podcast recently and Tim Zarkey was on there, our friend right. Tim Zarkey. And they were talking about doing larger projects and not necessarily being forced to post every single day about small little things. Right. So I feel like that was kind of the approach I took with this lamp project was like, hey, I'm just going to silo myself. I'm not going to show it off. I'm not going to really right. tell anyone about it. I'm just going to focus on it, close it out, you know, go into my little cave and work on it until it's ready right right so i don't know it's a, it's an interesting process that i've been doing but now i'm ex actually showing it off now so yeah i mean it's uh yeah i mean i was i kind of had that idea of like what if instead of posting every day we 
we decided as a community to just like post once a month. Oh, I remember you were telling me about that one time. To just, yeah, so it's not, there's not so much pressure in that you can then show off like a body of work over a month. But uh, no, I think it's cool because then, I don't know, then you just have all this material that you can then start documenting and exposing. And I feel like... I don't know. I don't know what the right approach is because I also feel like I don't. I mean, with, I don't think there is yeah, a right approach, but I also feel like you can just kind of take a snapshot of where you're at every day and not put so much pressure on having like beautiful, immaculate posts. Yeah, I mean, I think the the problem that I got into, at least, kind of coming off of the initial post every day thing, was the content creation just to content create, right? And I mean, this is a big thing. I don't know if you're familiar with like Gary Vee or, right. or, or some of the motivational guys, but you know, Gary Vee is all about posting process and not necessarily right. posting content. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. That's something I've been transitioning into. I think. Yeah, that's cool. Oh, hey, I got another, another, other exciting news. <laughs> um, I guess this is not design news, but <laughs> uh, I did my first wholesale. Nice. For almost object, yeah. So that's a, a thing, I guess. Oh, you can see if you're watching the video, I have a gazillion boxes oh, stacked yeah. up back here on my new. Wait, work can bench. I see? Can I see where it's being wholesaled here? Um, it's on Touch of Modern, so I think you had to sign up or something. But oh, really? Yeah, we we can link to it if you guys want to check it out. Yeah. So it's I can't just like search it. No. Oh come on. <laughs> Sorry, James. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's exciting. I mean, you know, I wanted to dive in a little bit into the wholesale game and just test test the water see how it worked yeah um so this is the first one and i don't know i mean it just started its sale so we'll see how it goes um and you know maybe i'll have to up up to you guys on the next episode on how it went yeah but i don't know i'm gonna try to keep dabbling around in it more i mean i got a thousand bottlers uh bottle uppers to push so i got (laughs) i gotta i gotta get sell them somewhere so um i don't know that's what i've been up to cool uh let's see oh follow up on last week's episode yeah we had a lot of great dis uh discord members chatting up dan yeah. dan grossman's episode yeah um there were some great comments in there i think a lot of people resonated with how dan balanced his his full-time kind of you know salaried work with his more humanitarian volunteer volunteer design right. work i thought that was really helpful and insightful to me at least and i think a lot of people resonated with that as well yeah um oh. yeah i think people i think people often think that they need to pack everything into one career right and that's like you can I you mean, got many years yeah hopefully. You, and you can you can separate those those parts of your life right i mean maybe it's not even like maybe it's just like local community charity work or whatever that's a good point rather than like i have to save the world like maybe you just save your community or or it help your community it does feel like uh i mean (laughs) i feel like we always dive it back into this but uh it does feel like a lot of people want to go out to the third world countries and and help those people but there's plenty of people right in our backyard that need help yeah and maybe it's just the community garden yeah like you said it doesn't even have to be design related it's great to just to help out sometimes yeah i mean there's there are some parts of america that are very impoverished and yes you know uh so i don't I, yeah i don't think that it necessarily has to be that you need to go abroad to to fix the problems of the world like you can start local and and maybe by starting local, you can start to start to figure out how to build it up to scale. That's a good point too. Start small and build it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone that contributed on the Discord. Really, yeah. really appreciate your comments, and I'm sure that Dan appreciates those as well. Yeah. Um, all right, now we're at design news. Ooh. <laughs> I think we had some some hot topics this week. Some uh, interesting designs came out. <laughs> yeah. That. You know, we we posted about and uh, people had some good comments on and some critical comments. One of the uh, newest designs that came out this past week was the new Ford Mustang Mach-E electric car. Yeah. Uh, So Ford released an electric Mustang. 
which, you know, I guess has good intentions, right? Obviously, electric cars are the future, in my opinion. Yeah. I'm a big Tesla fan, as you guys know. Um, I think the critical part comes in when you actually look at the thing. Right. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I definitely think the problem with electric cars in general is that they don't have a grill. Right. Like there's this whole area that used to be air intake, which yeah. now the motors are housed in the wheels and yeah. you don't need to cool them. Right. Or you probably do, but you know, it's not a big feature of the car anymore. And what do you do when that feature is gone? It looks yeah. weird. It looks awkward. It's you know <laughs> you know what it's like? Did you ever encounter the um the Facebook portal devices yeah. and they like, mm-hmm. and they, they like retroactively created this like camera cover. Oh, this was the Facebook Skype. Yeah. Kind of like, yeah. So they had like, it was like a tablet and yeah. you could like Skype your grandma. Or yeah. Okay. And, and they just like at the last minute because of all the privacy concerns yeah. added this camera cover. Right. I remember that. I mean, maybe, maybe it's not, maybe that's not the best comparison, but it does, it does start to feel like, it does start to feel like patchwork. It starts to feel like, oh, there was this area that we're used to designing, and now we're just gonna like, mm, let's just fill that in. It's interesting. Let's put a let's let's do a. This is what it is. It's like in SolidWorks, you do like a delete heel, like a surface. Fill. Yeah, oh surface my gosh. fill. Tangent. It, make it make sure it's tangent. Yeah, I don't know. It just it feels like. With electric cars, there's this opportunity to completely rethink the right. archetype of what a car is and what like what that front looks like. And right now, it does kind of feel just like it's just being patched up. Yeah, and maybe we are in this awkward kind of evolutionary phase of the car, right? It's the car notch. It is the. <laughs> it is the. the there you go. There's that's a good, that's it. a good uh, analogy for it. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a little bit also of a critique on Ford for putting this in the Mustang line. Yeah. Because the Mustang brand is very heavily rooted in that raw, you know, muscle car power. Right. And when you kind of throw the whole Tesla vibe into the, it just doesn't mix that well. Right. Like, it, it would make a lot more sense if it was like, oh, hey, it's the new Ford, you know, escape e or whatever you know whatever suv or crossover they have and they just called it the e i i don't know it i'm sure that there's definitely a lot of diehard mustang fans out there that are like this is terrible yeah and i also am you know i'm i i grew up as a ford guy so i definitely like the mustang and i definitely kind of have that feeling of like ah it kind of it doesn't feel right for the brand right has has uh, the sketch monkey? Has he done a redesign yet? Oh yeah, that was the he's a YouTuber that does like fixes desi- cars, right? Yeah. Oh, he did do a redesign. <laughs> oh, okay. So he just he made that area black because okay. I mean traditionally when you look through the Mustang line, all those areas are I mean I you know that is the intake, but it's it's always black, right? It's a, and so why does it have to be? Why does it have to be filled in? It does seem it does seem like this weird this weird thing that's that's not familiar to the Mustang line in general. Yeah. Well to I, fill that in. I mean, even making a, just a black space where the grill would be, it just it still feels a little bit like a lie. Yeah. Right? It's not honest. It's not honest design, as Dieter would say. I don't know. I think my favorite electronic vehicle were those those Honda electronic. Oh, the new one, the Honda. Or, not electronic, electric. Yeah, what are what, what are they? These uh, guys. It was the Honda E Honda electric e. car. I mean, this is this is well, this is more of a sports car, but this feels like this feels like a a unified vision, right? Of a car. It was like designed from the ground up to yeah. be electric, and it has that kind of. Cute. Here's another thing that's interesting. I wonder in the future when we have electric cars and they're, you know, more efficient, they don't need to be aerodynamic. Right. Like, 
you know, the Honda E electric car, it's kind of like more boxy. It has a flatter front and it kind of leans into the, the electric cute factor. Yeah. And it's definitely not as streamlined, but maybe that's okay if it's electric. Right. Because when it's gas, it's like, oh, it's, you know, it's definitely not as efficient. Oh, interesting. As electric cars, right? Yeah. I think, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm right. just making stuff up. But. I don't know. I, I also feel like with the autonomous vehicles... There's this whole thing of, of like, you're not, if you don't have a driver, is everybody facing each other? And like, does that then mean that there's no necessarily front or back? I feel like I've seen a lot of concepts where mm, there's right, no right, right. necessarily like front of the car and back of the car. Right. Um, and also, if a car is autonomous, it also probably is going to be more efficient as well. Right. We are terrible drivers in that we're always yeah. braking and pushing on the gas. Yeah. Whereas, whereas, Autonomous cars could easily like regulate traffic, and certainly they're not going to be tailgating anyone. Right. right. Did I tell you about this absurd idea? I was walking around the city and thinking about okay, if every car is autonomous, like, do we need stoplights? Like, do we need any of these things? <laughs> and like the idea that that these that cars instead of Instead of like waiting at a crosswalk to walk across the street, you could walk across the street and the cars would almost like sync in synchronicity, like move around you as you walked across the street. That'd be so scary. Like it it would almost be like water. You it would be like walking through water. The cars would just weave around like obstacles. Interesting. In just this sort of elegant pattern. Hmm. Uh anyway, very weird idea. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, the first time that I saw the the new Mustang, the E Mustang, the the Mach E, I was like, mm. uh, but as I'm looking at it, I'm just I don't know. It's just another car design. This is the other thing is I'm just generally like bored by yeah. car design because We're- I feel like. It's all the it's all the same. It's, it's all so dull right now. Yeah, I, agree. I think there definitely is a push, especially in the electric area, of doing these more radical designs. Right, because um, there are a lot of electric car shops that are doing stuff that is completely different. Yeah, and I would love to see some of those things come out. I do. Uh, you know, the other thing is, is, I do feel like I might be completely ignorant to car design and like just the 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 fine differences between cars That's that true. that like a more sculpturally minded person could see right. could really tell those differences but to me i just feel i just feel like there's there's not a lot of unique design going on like the differentiation between car companies is is just in the tiniest right. details yes yeah yeah and i that's just not how i would like things to be i mean maybe that's the future though maybe it doesn't even matter what the outside looks like if you're just right if it's just like an uber now like if it's all like autonomous ubers we don't even own the car anymore it's more of a utility right um i don't know it's interesting i also want to say like ford's a big company yeah like trying to steer that ship in in any direction that's very difficult it's like even i mean you gotta give them credit for at least putting out an electric vehicle that's that's worth worth it for itself for sure anyway um all right another another <laughs> design news yeah this was another topic that was posted about in the discord and got got some nice good debate going <laughs> uh as well as the the ford car we have the new nike uh shoe designed for medical workers in the hospital yes the nike air zoom pulse okay yeah um so from The background of this shoe, it sounds like the Nike team went, did their due diligence. They went into hospitals. They they observed uh, medical workers, what they needed in terms of footwear. Right. And so this this design ticks all of the boxes. Right. You know, it's got comfort. It's got the not the non slip. Um, Yeah. I mean, you know, people that work in the hospital are on their feet. 12 hours a day and that's it's a tough tough shift to to do and so i mean this shoe absolutely should be applauded for the due diligence should be applauded for you know uh taking taking this community of people that do so much for the broader community of people 
and giving them something that's very functional, very comfortable. But then there's the aesthetic. <laughs> and I, you know, it's one of those things that with the with the whole design thinking, human-centered design right. debate, where I feel like people people are willing to accept a certain level of aesthetics that maybe is not as thrilling as as a typical consumer product right and because they're they're saying like we're we're accomplishing all of these things for this niche group solving real problems and my my general feeling is is that i feel like medical professionals should have sweet gear like they should they should be excited right about the like the things that they have to put on every day yeah just the same as anybody else as a mass consumer as a football player as a you know whoever that is as a basketball player yeah yeah it's kind of like basketball shoes but for medical workers yeah I, yeah and you're you're right i mean it it does feel a little bit I don't know. I, maybe we should describe some of those aesthetics on it. I mean, it's, right. you know, your typical, well, the, the, the upper, I'm trying to learn my shoe, shoe language. I've been watching some Seth Fowler videos. <laughs> the upper, I believe, uh, has, it's not porous. It, it's, it's like a repellent, uh, I don't know, probably some, some urethane. We could look it up. I don't know. Right. I don't want to say what material cause I'm going to get it wrong, but, uh, <laughs> and then the heel has this elastic kind of strap on it that you can easily slip it on and off yeah um i think maybe the outsole is more the expressive unique or possibly polarizing design of it yeah uh it has this kind of uh pulse of a heartbeat going on yeah it's like an ekg pulse so they went a little bit literal with it and maybe that's a kind of the sticking point is like would you would you make a basketball shoe with a basketball on it? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's where I feel like Nike is typically so poetic about right. the, the symbols that they put into the shoes. Right. And well, we this... even had Detulo on, and he was talking right. about how he put 23 or two perfs, two holes and three holes for the Jordans for yeah. 23. And that yeah. was like so such a tiny little minor detail yeah that that's so poetic <laughs> where where you know where you put a heartbeat on the bottom of a shoe it's kind of like right i mean you know maybe it it could have been more abstracted or something yeah i also there was something with the asterisk there's like an asterisk as well yeah i mean they collaborated with minor details and put an asterisk <laughs> on the bottom <laughs> without our consent <laughs> um but yeah i mean it's it's it is i think they also they describe it as like clog like yeah almost I, traditional clog made athletic i just sort of you know so there's no lace there's there's none of that sort of language around it it is just a slip on slip off right sort of thing so that kind of does drive a certain aesthetic to an extent and i think that you know there's probably a lot of logic to the upper in just terms of like the amount of materials used and having that splash repellent, you know, liquid repellent uh, material there. But yeah, when it gets to the, when it gets to the outsole, I do feel like they get into something that almost seems poetic with these dots. I, I did read in the, in the statement that the dots are very intentional so that it, the, the shoes traction isn't compromised. Right. Uh, but it it feels it feels like there's this weird transition from the out from the out like the the sides of the outsole to the to underneath where it just it suddenly has this dot pattern and it just it kind of just feels disjointed i i feel like it does kind of it doesn't feel like one unified vision yeah i of, mean it, part of me feels like there might have been in kind of going back to the one point of like there, there are some crazy colorways too. Like there's yeah. some crazy patterns and kind of graphics that are on there, which do feel a little bit inspired by maybe some of the medical workers were like, hey, it would be cool if this was printed all over the shoe. Yeah. And, you know, maybe, maybe this is something that, you know, people in the medical industry would like. Maybe they do want that kind of 
striking like the one we're looking at right now is a rainbow paw print yeah. uh and I, you know i'm not sure what that refers to but i'm sure it refers to something but you know maybe they want that that colorful striking imagery in the hospital that's kind of bland yeah like maybe that is their kind of way of expression so what it's saying here is that they're actually going to be selling these colorways so uh the dorn becker freestyle program benefits innovative health care advances and so six patient designers oh okay have so added an air zoom pulse to their individual collections those six versions of the shoe will be released on december 7th and all profits will be donated to the uh dorn becker children's hospital got it um so that those ones are like patient design yeah or or medical design. I mean, I'm actually like kind of digging this black, this all black one with the blue sole here. But, yeah. but yeah, I just, I don't know. I feel like this is, this is, you know, obviously this is the first time that they've attempted this type of shoe, at least as far as I know, right. you know, specifically for medical workers. And I feel like it is sometimes hard to understand how to sort of implement all of these things into, into one when you're when you're starting from scratch right and so maybe version two is going to be a lot more aspirational or i don't know i mean and and there was this argument on the discord of like what what do the medical professionals want sort of deal versus like what do we as designers think that they should have right should aspire to yeah right and that's where i'm really divided i mean that's a whole like just topic of design in general because that yeah. that spans plenty of industries yeah because i because i do kind of feel like it's it's weird it's weird to constantly be like checking with the consumer to be like do you like this right like are you gonna like this right because we're making this for you and we want you to buy it right so are you gonna like it yeah <laughs> and it's like shouldn't shouldn't we have some base understanding of like what what people will want, desire, I mean, think is beautiful. Of course. I mean, we, that's our job. We are hired because we do have an aesthetic sensibility that is better than the normal consumer. Right. Right. If everyone had the exact same aesthetic sensibility, then we wouldn't need designers. Like, right. We would just be like, oh, yeah, the engineer is a, is, is a consumer and he has the same aesthetic ability as all of us. So, like, he yeah. can do it, you know? Right. Um, so, like, you know, we do need to use our intuitions to design really nice looking shoes. And I do think it is a balance though. Like yeah. it's in in terms of functionality, like it's great to go into the hospital and see these, you know, I, I in Texas, I knew a pe- few people that worked in the hospital and like they work long hours. It's a yeah. tough job. Oh yeah. Um, There's, they absolutely deserve a shoe that's taken this seriously. Right. And then I also, I do want to add to this because Again, this is kind of like one of those things where it hasn't really been touched by design yet. Right. When you think about, you know, there there are some nicer designed, you know, medical shoes out there, but most of them are just like clogs. Like most of them are just like black leather. Like it's just not attractive. So like doing anything remotely good, like is going from zero to a hundred. Right. You know, but there's always room to improve, I think. Yeah. I... Yeah, I, I am curious to see if they're going to attempt a version two, if that's if that's something that's coming down the pipeline. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess we'll see how these ones do in the market. Right. Um, so yeah, I think I think we get into this this thing though within the design community, and I don't know quite how to figure this out. This. Uh, this whole thing around critiquing designers work yeah. because we as designers know that being a designer is challenging being a designer at, you know, to, to try and solve a specific problem is very challenging. And on top of that, to make it aesthetic or whatever, all of it is challenging because there's, there's often so many variables. There's the stakeholders, there's the company you're working for, there's the team you're on. Yeah. And I, I would just, I want to figure out how to have productive, critical conversations about design without feeling like 
I am betraying my right, fellow right, right. designer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? For sure. Um, because we all understand, like, how challenging it is. And so I, I don't know. I don't know how how to quite do that. I mean, I, I would hope. I, I would say most design schools teach critiques pretty well. Like, it's, it's mm-hmm. usually you say something you like and something you don't like. And it, it has to be, like, a. I feel like there does need to be some sort of balance there. Right. Either whether it is, like, hey you know, this is incorrect in your design. Here's a new way to do it. Or here's maybe a possible way to explore. I mean, that's the proper way to critique. When I see like people post on my comment on on, like an Instagram post or something, it's like, oh, this sucks. I'm like, well, I checked your post and you just posted a photo of you with your dog. Like, (laughs) (laughs) Like, I'm out here doing stuff. What are you doing? You know? So I don't know. It's, it's, yeah. I mean, I think it's something that you just have to, not everyone's going to be, we live in a world, everyone has different, different opinions and viewpoints you got to just right. accept that everyone has different views it's not yeah like it, sure. yeah if you if you want everyone to have the same viewpoint as you like i don't think that's healthy way, right way to look at things right yeah i think i think the the most influence the seemingly most inflammatory thing that i said during the discussion on the discord what was that was that i think i think beauty and desirability is harder than function oh yeah that's right people people were not about that yeah, because, oh, man, that's that's a good, like, which is harder, doing the aesthetics or figuring out how, how it works? Because my my feeling is, is there there's like, maybe maybe when you're talking about innovation with function, right? then that is challenging. Right, like but, if you're inventing a new iPhone or something, that's right. pretty hard. But I'm talking about in a sea of seemingly similar products right. that all do the same thing. Right. The one difference between them, the one thing that will make you purchase something is beauty and desirability. And that, I think, is incredibly challenging. And even when you're working on innovative products, to make those things then, like, beautiful is incredibly challenging. I think, yes, well, I'm not exactly sure. I I think, so, uh, I think it might have been someone in the Discord said, the challenge isn't either or. The challenge is combining both, mm-hmm. which I thought was a good way to sum it up. But um, I still think be- I still think that there are a smaller a smaller group of designers who can make like incredibly beautiful objects. That's true. Maybe that's a good point. That's a good point to your and statement. And I feel like I not to say that because there's there's a lot of designers out there that can make a good thing that's functional. Right. But there's n- less designers that can make a, a amazing, beautiful thing that's right. functional. And, and the functional thing is always there. Like, that's a requirement yeah. to make it, to sell the product. Right. So, like, really the only differentiator is the beauty part. Yeah. And to mm-hmm. clarify, I don't consider myself a part of that group. I aspire <laughs> to be a part of that group. Right. But I, but I don't consider myself there. But... I that is that is a personal aspiration. I love when things things function because like things that function well, there's almost a beauty to that. Mm. But I also I also think that our lives I have this kind of like new this new uh idea. I don't know if I've talked about it on the pod, but like I think about the person who goes into a Walmart and they're just like I just need a spatula right. or something. Yeah. And my my thing is that I feel like my obligation to design and I feel like everybody's obligation when it comes to design is when it comes to that type of person and that type, type of purchase, I feel like that person should absentmindedly be buying the most beautiful thing that they've ever bought. And not know why. Not know why. Like... It's out of pure need, right. out of pure necessity. You see three on the shelf and they just pick the one that's like, oh, this one looks good. Yeah. And it looks, it. they say, oh yeah, it looks good. Yeah. But there's so much subconscious things going on in their brain. Right. Right. And so like, I just, I want, I want people when they have to buy something that they have the option of beautiful products that they can bring into their home. And I do feel like, there's a, and maybe there is research on this. I just don't know, but I think there is such like a, a psychological benefit 
to people that the things that are surrounding them are beautiful. Like, I think that that's just, it's a benefit to anybody who's just, you know, who's living. I totally agree for sure. So anyway, that's a, that's a good thought. That's a good thought. Um, but yeah, we want to hear what you guys think about all these, uh, news updates. I know that you've already shared a, I know some of you on the Discord have already shared your thoughts. Yeah. But uh, if you're listening right now, hop back in, you know, uh, check it out and contribute your comments as well. We want to hear them. For sure. All right. The main event. The main event. The main topic. <laughs> uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about this idea I've had about when you get a project that maybe you're not excited about or or something, a lot of times we go into this this phase of like, oh, I don't want to do this. Right. Like, you know, you, you like, you kind of like drag your feet or whatever. But I want to talk about the times where it's, you change your mindset to not think about the fact that you don't want to do it. Yeah. You, you look at the fact that there's something in this project that you do want to focus on. And you do want to do. Right. Um, and I, I guess part of this is like coming from the idea that a lot of times designers and this happens to everyone i think I, I maybe there's a few designers out there that this doesn't happen to but a lot of times designers show their best work right right it's what we you know we put our we put the stuff we're proud of on our website for sure and that is only a fraction of the stuff that we have done i think i probably designed like 90 pet products when i was at pet mate right and I think there's only like two on my website and I'm probably going to take those two down eventually, like <laughs> probably in the next year, I'll put some other stuff up. 90. A lot of products. Wow. A lot of products. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I just kind of like skew numbers. So like some of those products are just in like different colors or sizes. And stuff. Right, right, right. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a lot of stuff and sometimes To do 90 products that you're proud of in two years, like you got to, I don't know who, who can do that. I, yeah, I certainly can't. And I think a lot of times you just have to accept the fact that sometimes you're not going to be able to design the best thing every single time. Right. Sometimes you are going to have to design something that hits a deadline and you're like, I could have done better. And I think maybe... I just wanted to say that, like, that's okay. Yeah. Like, sometimes it's a great learning experience. Right. Um, so, I think there's a few projects in my past that I wanted to bring up because they're dark secrets that I've never told or shown <laughs> anyone. <laughs> you probably you might be able to Google them. I don't even know. Yeah. Um, well, let's hear about them, because I because I need to I need to have a have a moment to think about. The products um, in my past. I mean, one one of the things is like, all right, you guys ready for this? <laughs> Y'all ready for this? I designed WWE dog toys. Heck yeah. Yes, the worldwide wrestling entertainment. Is it? What do you, do you even know? I, it used to be worldwide wrestling federation, right? It is fake wrestling. It's world wrestling entertainment world wrestling entertainment uh we you know maybe some of you are familiar with wrestling uh it's you got john cena he's a he's a wrestler i don't know it's even it's just hilarious talking about this stuff right um but yeah so i i designed some wwe dog toys at petmate and yeah this is actually when i first got the job so i'm fresh out of school you know, I'm super excited to get into the industry and start right. making real products. Yeah. And my first project is like, the boss comes to me. My, bo- my boss is great. And he was like, all right, Nick, you know, we just signed this licensing deal to license all of the, uh, all the uh, uh, co- copywriting and, or I don't know, intellectual property from all these wrestlers. Right. And I'm yeah. like, interesting. I, you know, I've n- never was in the wrestling like scene. I never really watched a wrestling match. Yeah. And yeah, over the next six months, I probably watched all the wrestling matches. Yeah. <laughs> and I learned a lot about all of them. <laughs> there was a lot of them. There, there's, there's also the women's wrestling. There's the, yeah, the yeah. that whole side of things. Yeah. Which, 
you know, people walk by my desk and see women wrestlers on my, just like I'm watching a women <laughs> wrestle on my YouTube. And they, you know, they went straight to HR and I had to talk to HR a couple times. Oh. I'm, I'm kidding. That didn't happen. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I don't know. It was, it was just interesting because, you know, it's this project straight out of school that it's like, okay, you know, maybe not the most glamorous thing. Yeah. Something that I am already starting realizing that there's no way I'm going to put this on my website, right? Like, I'm not going to be, you know, s- proud of like a John Cena, you know, you know, dog toy. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe if it was the first one, I don't know. It's just like something that you're not super excited about. And the thing is, is like, you have to, like, this is just part of design. Right. Sometimes you do have to take these projects. And you can either sit around and mope and complain about the entire process, or you can just like grab grab the horn, or the, grab the bull by the horns. Yeah, and grab John Cena by the horns. <laughs> grab John Cena, hop on his back, um, uh, and you know try to learn something from the process. Right. So I learned a lot about licensing. Yeah, I hadn't done licensing before, and so like working with a company that had all this you know intellectual property around how john cena should look and how he mm. you know all of his hand motions and his like what are his hand motions oh he, he is part of it yeah yeah he has he, he you know he holds up his hand and he waves it in front of his face and he says you can't see me right? oh yeah, yeah. he's quick uh yeah he's uh quick i think i don't know I can't remember. <laughs> but that's like they all have their special moves and it's it is entertainment like and yeah. it was kind of fun well I would, yeah like, i got to meet john cena well that's really so, cool yeah he's a cool guy yeah mm-hmm he, you just did where did you meet him uh we went to a wdw event i actually think it went to two of them and they could, took us backstage because yeah. we were part you know part of the special crew or whatever um you know got to go up to the ring and everything and yeah like, yeah that's fun i mean here's the thing here's like like this is kind of a tangent but this is one of those things that's like an interesting sort of like cultural societal sort of uh investigation is like you know the wwe is incredibly popular Uh uh-huh it is and i think when you know it's one of those things where as like i feel like as designers especially when you're coming right out of design school you have kind of this like (laughs) this like arrogance about you about like what is and is not design what's good and what's bad yeah right right? yeah yeah, yeah. and it's like this is an incredibly popular pop culture sort of medium and it's and i think that that is like a fascinating thing in itself because it's like like what is it about this that is so like captivates people right because it's like everybody knows it's fake. Right. Like there's nobody who's like except oh, for the this, kids. There's this, probably some younger kids. Yeah, that think probably it's real. the younger kids. But it's like. <laughs> but don't tell them that it's fake. He'll cry. But you know, it's like they fill arenas full of people yeah. to see this stuff, and it's like, okay, what is that about? Right. Like, did you did you get any sort of idea of what it was all about while you were working on the project? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of like, I mean, a lot of these people are really inspirational on the side they have a lot of like social presence i mean you think about dwayne the rock johnson right he's he doesn't the he's in the wwe yeah um and he has a huge you know he does a lot of things beyond wwe right but a lot of it is like motivation and like people are excited about these people that you know are doing these kind of feats of acrobatics and things like that um and another thing kind of add to your point i think was it was really good is that like understanding the culture behind this is a design problem in of of itself, right? Because there might be a few designers out there that are fans of WWE, but I would, you know, I would go out on a limb and say that the majority of designers probably aren't attracted to this stuff, right? It's it's not very design oriented. It's very yeah. kind of entertainment oriented. Um, so it's you know it's a cool problem to solve. Like how do you kind of get into the culture and understand it and try to embrace it and yeah use that to create an uh an object for you know a family that wants to like have fun with their dog have yeah. fun with their pet yeah because it, it like the whole licensing thing i think 
I would wager that designers in general out of design school or maybe just maybe even beyond that, when they think of licensing, they I feel like they think that using characters and whatever is kind of this cheap, like kitschy trick yeah. that we use yeah. to like dupe consumers into buying things. Right. But I do I mean I, I would do love like, a Daft Punk dog toy. Right. Like I do wonder what the feeling is when somebody's walking through a pet shop and they see that John Cena toy. Yeah. Like are they are they super excited? It, like is I'm, that, I'm sure there was a few know? people that like that. I, I will say you know, and I'm not I I was just a designer, so I don't know the whole business plan right. or anything like that. I think it might have been a little bit hard because, again, uh, trying, you know, when you work in a more like consumer product company, you have to sell to these big box stores. Yeah. And there's a person that buys those products. They're called buyers. And the a lot of the buyers were not the WWE kind of demographic. Oh, I see. So, you know, just as when my boss came to me and was like, hey, Nick, we're designing WWE dog toys. When Petme went to the buyers and they're like, hey, look at these awesome WWE dog toys. You know, there's probably like, you know, people that, you know, <laughs> Melissa age 40, like yeah. probably is not as into WWE as maybe some of the people that would be interested. Wait, so you said that we can maybe look this up? Yeah. Look these toys yeah, up? Yeah, look up John Cena rubber dog toy pet mate maybe. Um, uh, and then we had an amazing sculptor do the caricatures oh man these are like <laughs> these were the best so these were the rubber uh like characters yeah um so you know i i sent some quick sketches over to the sculptor and uh i i kind of want to shout them out I forget, these are I forget sweet big shot toy works i believe was the sculptor yeah big shot toy works. uh really great uh, kind of toy sculpting. Yeah, no, these are these are kind of like, uh, you know, like kid robot, like designer mm-hmm. toy level. Yeah, so that's what we we're kind of going for is that designer toy. Aesthetic. I mean, that's that's taking what could be a really cheap, right, prompt and and elevating it to the next level, right? Because I could see somebody buying this toy just to put it on their desk right. because they're like, I don't want my dog destroying this. This is awesome, right? It's um, like, again, like that's where the whole mind mindset changing thing came in. It was like, oh, how can we make this thing look super cool? Right? right. Like, yeah, you can be bummed that it's a certain brand or whatever. But like, hey, you know, designer toys are cool. Like, yeah. Well, how, how about we do a designer toy of John Cena that's a dog toy? Right. Um. So, yeah, shout out to to these guys. So did you have to, did you, like who found these guys? Uh, I think I searched them up because they, you know, I was searching a lot of designer toys, doing a lot of sketching and stuff. Yeah. And so we just connected with them. Um, That's cool. And so how how much of the design were you actually sketching out? And then how much of it were they sort of like you were selling them like, hey, we want them in this kind of position? Yeah, and... yeah. So, yeah, I, I worked more on the like the licensing side. Like, right. oh, hey, John Cena needs to do his like five finger hand pose right yeah um and then they were able to you know you know sculpt that and create the the character of it yeah this Um, is i mean it's pretty it's actually pretty sweet i have to say yeah and i if i saw that if i saw that at a dog you know like a toy store or um a pet a pet store i would be like okay yeah i can get into that that's pretty sweet um so that that seems like yeah that seems like approaching approaching that prompt the right way. So I don't know. I I thought I'd just share that story because I think it's just something that we should always think about as designers. Like, right. Instead of complaining, you know, there's a lot of complainers out there. Like just, <laughs> <laughs> and you know who you are. You know. You know. <laughs> uh, you know. Find the details that you can really be excited about and yeah. pursue those. Yeah, they're probably out there being like, but I can't contact <laughs> uh, designer toy makers. Listen, those people don't go anywhere live, so. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know if you had any more extra thoughts on that, James, or. Oh, man. I mean, I've I certainly. Think you had some good points in there. I've certainly had some times um, 
you know, when I was at, I, I, it's funny because I feel like when I was at Lifetime Brands, there were some similar situations where I feel like there were times that it were probably akin to what you experienced at PetMate because it was just a lot of design. Um, and I had to do some stuff for Guy Fieri. Oh, Fieri. that's kind of similar. Although Guy Fieri is very, uh, he's a meme. He's in meme yeah, culture. He's a meme lord. Yeah. Uh, I, none of that stuff got produced. Okay. Thank God. <laughs> But it was it was like very rock and roll inspired stuff, oh, yeah. and uh, You've got that rock like, and roll spatula. I mean, it was flipper. it was literally one of my early projects, and I I think I just took it as a chance to just really understand because because the thing was at Lifetime Brands, and I know that this was similar for you at Petmate was designing production CAD, like doing the production CAD, and so. That was, you know, I I was doing that for the first time. So that in itself was like this learning process. And so I used those projects as a way to learn like good manufacturing techniques. That is, that's a, yeah, that's a great insight as well. Because just because you're not excited about the project doesn't mean you can't learn. Like it's, it's still a product that you're learning and honing your skills on. Here's here's another thought. Yeah, here's what's, a, what's your thought? So like, you know, you have to. I, I mean, I think about, I think about the artists of the past, and they had these studios. You think any kid who like walked in there right after, you know, like, they're, they're, <laughs> Michael it's their Michael first job. <laughs> Michael Andrew has an intern, and he's like, oh yeah, can you just paint the ceiling? Yeah, and it's like, <laughs> no. it's. I feel. I mean, do do we feel at all in? After we've done design school, do we have this? Do we have the sense of entitlement of I this S- design, some people do. This design is beneath me, and it's like there is some people out there that that you we all know this that person right. that that has that like this design is beneath me attitude, yeah. And then their portfolio is terrible. <laughs> you know, you know, we all know. I have, yeah. <laughs> I know. I, I well, there was people at my school, like but that. it's it is it is kind of like you need to you need to sweep the floors, get the coffee, do the dirty work before you can really. It's definitely. I, I think we we get this warped perception by seeing all these young tech entrepreneurs that we're supposed to be at the top levels of decision making right out of school, right? And I mean, there is the rare exception to this. But sometimes you just kind of have to slog, right. slog through the dirt. And that's okay. Yeah, that's, that's okay. That You got to enjoy that. But I think at the same time, you kind of still have to have your mind, your eyes on the prize because you can also get used to slogging in the dirt mm. and just like that becomes your right. career. And then you become dull to it and that's, yeah, yeah. that's no good. And so I think, I think it's both understanding that you need to jump through a few hoops on your way to the design director position, but always have your eye set on the design director position. Right. You know, you're working towards that. This is, you know, or whatever your goal is, right? Yeah. Whatever your goal is. And, and again, too, I think even if you are slogging, there's always those small areas that you can improve upon. Right. Um, For sure. I don't know. Let us know your thoughts, you guys. Yeah. Join Uh, the Discord. Join the Discord. For heaven's sake. (laughs) We saw the survey. We know how many people are joined. (laughs) Uh, um, And then if you have a question, send it to minordetailspodcast at gmail.com. Yep. We we got a couple questions here. And... Cue them up. Actually, this one didn't come from the the Gmail. But we do prefer Gmail. So definitely send your questions to Gmail if you can. Uh, Our first question comes from Marvell. And they asked in the Discord, what do you do when you schedule a 80% done checkpoint and the client says, well, we'll take it as is. I guess it doesn't seem to be a, like a big problem, but I intentionally stopped short of the last detail refinements in case they had any edits. Now they don't want any edits, but the pro- the, the design is not polished, mm-hmm. not very polished. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting little scenario there. Like what do you, what happens when you're still working through the design and the client comes by or your boss comes by and says, okay, uh, send, send the CAD file over. Yeah. That's a, uh, that's a tough scenario. 
It, it is it is really tough. I don't know. I don't know what you do in that case. I mean, I think it's a little bit a little bit easier if it's like a client scenario cuz yeah. cuz then you can like if it, if it's your boss walking by your desk and they're like, "All right, send me the CAD file like right now." You're you're done. I mean, I mean, you could obviously say like, "Hey, I'm still working on the the design. Can I take a few extra uh you, like you can be, i think maybe just be transparent about it like yeah. hey you know i'm I'm still working right on the few little details can i send it to you tomorrow or something yeah. like that i mean is it a case where it's like we've given you three weeks <laughs> you know like i well in that case it seems like it might be user error. yeah i mean i Design think error. um that that is an interesting thing i mean i remember this is this is something that i've been debating for a while now which is should you should you really show clients sketches cuz sometimes i feel like clients just don't know how to read sketches and they get caught up on the wrong details yeah. and it's like and and so along with that should the rule be that like whatever you're showing you'd be okay with the client just grabbing that that's an interesting in rule. the moment cuz because I, I see what you're saying. It's like on the other side of that, you can show, if you don't show sketches, you're probably showing renderings. Yeah. And that's where the client is like, oh, that one looks good. Let's right. make it. Yeah. And then you're like, well, hang on a second. I, yeah. I, I, had, I didn't think about all the details yet. Like, <laughs> uh, it's not done yet. Right. Um, but I, I almost, I mean, the other thing is, is like, how is the client how is the client just going to move move forward? Is it that that they're they're not going to pay you anymore to finish it out? Yeah, I mean that's a that I feel like that's more of like a client relationship area of uh, of the solution. Like it's not really about the design at that point. It's right. really about how do you frame the project right. from the start so that it's it's fully completed from the beginning. Yeah, because you know there are that there are a few scenarios where. I've gotten in where it's like I quote a project and I'm like, Hey, this will be the full project costs. And they're like, Oh, you know, it's not, it's over our budget or whatever. What if you just did the first half of the project, like just the sketch phase or just the concept phase. And I have done that. And then, you know, you're delivering just, you know, maybe a final concept and, you know, then it's kind of like up in the air and how that thing actually sees it right sees itself into the world it who knows if i'll even make it yeah i definitely feel like that's not the best way to go about things i think that sometimes you you just have to take projects like you gotta pay the bills right um i don't know yeah i don't know i guess i've just never been in this scenario i've always i've always had clients that are just taking it all the way through to the point right. where I've, I feel like yes, this is ready to hand over. But I feel like that's also a result of working within design teams as a as a freelancer. Right. I think this scenario comes up when you're thinking about maybe uh, more smaller independent freelancers. When you know, say there's a, you know, your mom or pop has an idea for a a Kickstarter project, right? right? You get the, like the Kickstarter emails of like, Oh, Hey, I have this Kickstarter idea. Can you help me design it? Yeah. And the, you know, it's pretty common. I I see the emails and I'm sure that there's probably some of you out there that have gotten these emails and it's like, yeah, you get a quote and you know, either they don't take it or they take it. But people that are starting Kickstarters are usually pretty like, it's usually like a side project. Like it's always usually restricted on budget. So that's where you get to this scenario of like, oh, I just wanted to do half the project or just the first half. I'll just take the sketch and send it to the factory. Yeah. I mean, is it a case of just like holding the CAD hostage? I mean, yeah. I think part of this, Marvell, is like you could do the extra due diligence from the goodness of your heart and like spend a day finishing the design. Yeah. But again, it kind of feels like in this scenario, and I don't know, I'm just assuming, but... The client was like, "Okay, this is good enough. You know, I I, I want I don't want to, you know, go over my budget or anything. So we'll just take it as is." Right. So I don't know. It's a it's a interesting scenario, but yeah. I think maybe the the solution is just kind of building that 
full project from the onset and make sure it's encapsulated in a payment structure that doesn't shortcut it. Yeah. Maybe that's a project fee or instead of like an hourly thing or something like that. For sure. All right. One more question or we should we do shout out of the week? I think we uh, will uh, save the question for next time. All right. Um, uh, shout out of the week. We have at visualize value on Instagram. A little different, different uh, non Well, I guess it's kind of design, uh, graphic design. Uh, Visualize Value is a just curated quote graphic uh, Instagram, and uh, I don't know. I I just enjoy the way that their graphics are laid out. They're super minimal. They're all on this like black background with white text and graphics. Yeah, and it's just really nice. It's it's just something to kind of cheer up your day and. Kind of, I guess, go along with our our topic of the week of like, you know, just changing your mindset about things and, and framing things in a different perspective. Right. Um, yeah, it's interesting because it's one of those it's one of those Instagrams where you're like, <laughs> like it's a quote Instagram, and yeah, you're like, I, oh, would, I don't want to follow right. a quote it's Instagram. A, it, it's like I would never, <laughs> I would never be like, you know what? I'm going to start a quote Instagram because it just feels like such a saturated market. You're lying, like, James. You did start a quote Instagram. <laughs> oh no, it you're, was on my you're, Instagram. You're my made up quotes. Your made up quotes. That was OG. Um, go back and look at that. Made up, James's made up quotes. But uh, this is a case where um, aesthetics, beauty has actually has actually made this I, I in my opinion it's made it a much more desirable a much more enjoyable kind of quote instagram because it has this consistency to it i know exactly when i've stumbled across it and i slide through the quotes but it's you know it's very graphically pleasing and it it just visualizes the quotes in a very unique way. Yes, for sure. Um, so I, yeah, I think it's, it's one of those really cool things where I, um, you know, you could have a conversation with somebody and say, yeah, I'm going to start this quote, Instagram going to be graphic. And they're like, Oh no, <laughs> don't no. Why would you do that? That's so no, don't yeah, do yeah. it. But it's like, I think some sometimes these are the most interesting projects, the projects where somebody finds that that little I don't know, that zhuzh, that yeah. like that that place where nobody else has really taken it to. Right. Where you think that all of it has been exhausted. Yeah. Or it's just been outplayed. It's you know, right. it's been played out. And they find that that opportunity. Definitely. So it's a cool, it's a cool Instagram. Check them out at Visualize Value on mm-hmm. Instagram. Yeah. Um, and yeah, thanks for listening, you guys. Let us know what you thought about the episode. Of course, join the Discord. Uh, and then send us questions, my details podcast at gmail.com. Heck yeah. Um, you can follow on Spotify. You can rate five stars and Apple Podcast. Leave a little comment too. It really helps out. I think we're we've plummeted in the rankings oh no yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no i'm just kidding <laughs> actually I don't, I don't really know i haven't checked in a while but um google play google, is a thing pl- google as well? podcast google podcast i forget you guys know you guys know what to do um and intro and outro is by the amazing kiyoshi the kid and as always i'm at nick p baker and i'm at i drawn receipts peace later